All of us at Saunderstrom Air Base have asked ourselves at one time or another, what am I doing here? Well, tonight AFTV8 takes a special look at why we're here, life at the die sites. The distant early warning line, or dew line, is a string of radar stations that stretches from Alaska across Canada to the east coast of Greenland. The four radar sites in Greenland are auxiliaries of a main site at Camp Dyer, Canada, which is known as Die Main. So the four in Greenland are called Die 1, Die 2, Die 3, and Die 4. Okay, our prime mission is the detection, the identification, and the reporting of all air-breathing vehicles within our operational area. You say reporting, how do you report those two? Okay, we're using the equipment that we have in the console room, we report to data centers, which are staffed by U.S. Air Force personnel. And we are just part of the link, where we report, and they're just following the tracks of the aircraft as they move from operational area to operational area and they have certain target windows that these aircraft have to meet. So they know who they are. I believe they are supposed to, based on the track and their flight plans, they are supposed to hit their windows plus or minus 20 miles, plus or minus 5 minutes. And if they don't, you know... Then we just pass this information on to the data officer and they take whatever actions they feel are necessary. We receive usual supply support flights out of Sondestrom about three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, although that can be augmented based on cargo requirements or especially if there's a prime mission item that we need to support. How important is Sondestrom to the support of the die sites? Sondestrom is the key to the support of the die sites. All support that these four installations receive is from Sondestrom. Now, Die 1 is supported by helicopter. Die 2 and 3 are supported by the de Havilland Dash 6, or Twin Otter as we refer to it. And Die 4 is supported by the de Havilland Dash 7. But Sondi is always the hub. Everything that we receive goes through Sondi first and then comes to us, be it Sea lift, food, fuel, mail, everything. When you visit a die site, the first thing you notice is the size of the building. It's deceptive. Looking at it from ground level, it doesn't seem possible that it has five floors. But not only does it have five floors, it weighs 3,300 tons and can accommodate 35 people. When you arrive at Die 2, the first thing you receive is a warm welcome. Once inside, you're given a fire regulation pamphlet and a general information guide. Fire awareness is an important concern anywhere, but when there's no immediate help available, the concern becomes even more important. Should something happen to this one building, we have lost our capability of prime mission. And uh, based on the severity of that loss, we could even anticipate loss of life. We have a full-time fire brigade made up of the station personnel that are trained monthly in fire prevention and suppression techniques. Everyone is acutely aware of the need to suppress a fire should it get started as soon as possible. The most efficient way of suppressing a fire is not to let it get started in the first place. So as much as we emphasize fire suppression, we try to emphasize even more prevention, constant reminders, because should in the extreme case, we have a severe fire that we cannot control. We do have the flexibility 
of another structure that is removed from this building, which is our garage slash survival building, which also has its own power generation facility, so that should we ever find ourselves having to evacuate this building for whatever reason, we do have another shelter where we can wait for rescue from Saunders Run. What if communications to the other die sites goes down in a fire? The sites would know immediately simply because they would lose the link. So they would know something is wrong. Now we have both on the station, besides the main communication, we have disaster and emergency radios, which are independent of our lateral comm. The emergency radio is located on the building, so that should we use, lose the lateral comm, we can use the emergency radio to contact the other stations. If we have to abandon the building, out in the garage slash survival building, we have what we call our disaster radio, which is again powered by the garage's own power generator, and we can then make contact with the other sites and appraise them of what the situation is. Inside the information guide is the daily routine schedule, which gives the times when the workday starts and ends, break times, and the times for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Speaking of dinner, every Saturday night at Die 2, the chef prepares a special dinner. On alternating Saturday nights, Danish or American food is featured. Anna Peterson is the chef at Dai Tu, and Klaus Lorenzen was visiting for a few days, and I had a chance to talk with him about cooking at a Dai site. I have the master menu. I can look at, but I may got my own menus because it depends on what we have in the refrigerator. So lots of time, perhaps I can't make what the master menu tells you to do. So you have to. I'm afraid I'll cook, bake a cake or make a dessert or perhaps I have to clean the kitchen because I have to do all the cleaning here myself and wash the dishes and when the food comes in by plane we have to store it in the deep freezer or the refrigerator. After dinner, there's nothing like a good drink. The bar at Dai 2 is no different from the bars at the Caribou Club or the Fox and Hare Club, with one exception. There's no bartender. You can purchase a bar card in increments of $5 up to a maximum of $20. It's a fully stocked bar, and it's called the Hotel California, which lends a hint of warmth to this cold climate. As was mentioned earlier, the mission of the die site is to monitor all aircraft that enters its area. But it takes a lot of work just to keep the site operational. The site is manned by only 14 people and they're kept busy. Snow is gathered and melted for daily use, showers, laundry, and drinking water. The engines in the power plant are carefully monitored and the oil inside the engines has to be at a certain thickness to prevent the all-important engines from breaking down. And the outside vehicles have to be properly maintained to be able to operate in the frigid temperatures. It takes people with certain qualifications to do these jobs. The men who work on the vehicles outside have to be both operation engineers and qualified mechanics. The men that operate and monitor the power plant engines must have an engineer certificate. The additions or electronics technicians need to have extensive electronics backgrounds to operate the radars. But this is only the technical side of the operations of the die site. What about the people that work at a die site? How do they stay in prime operating condition? According to Jeff Gwynn, the station supervisor, and Tony Schwanda, the lead mechanic, a person has to have certain goals that he wants to accomplish during his stay at the station a length of stay that averages two or three years. 
It also takes not a small amount of self-discipline to stay in a confined area for any length of time. When a person appears to be having difficulty coping with his situation, a vacation is usually the cure. But Jeff says there haven't been any such problems at his station recently. In fact, there's a very friendly atmosphere to be found at Die 2. I hope in the past few minutes we've answered a few of your questions about the die sites. Before we go tonight, I'd like to thank everybody at both die sites and at FSI who helped us with this production. I'm Raymond Nooksarche for TV8.